Yeah, so to get started for today's community call, um, as I just mentioned, we just got off a brainstorming session with the Center for Open Science. And so I wanted to kind of uh, relay some of the ideas that they had for how we could potentially collaborate when it comes to like helping to incentivize certain behaviors. So I'll go ahead and list some of the ideas and then we can just chat about them afterwards to see what you guys are most excited about. Um, the first one is uh, having some kind of reward for people sharing preprints on Open Science Framework preprint servers. They have like this kind of out of the box ability for any scientific field to create their own preprint server. Um, there's one for like biohackers, there's one for sports medicine, SciArchive is a big one um, where Open Science Framework helps support it. Um, and in theory, what could happen is when people share preprints, it would be automatically posted to Research Hub. Um, the author of the preprint would receive tokens immediately, like they had claimed their paper. Um, and then the actual preprint server would also receive some tokens as well in order to help make them more self-sustaining. Um, I'm not sure if you all are familiar, but uh, Law Archive used to be a preprint server that was supported by uh, Open Science Framework. And it's just like case law, like research papers for legal stuff. Um, but they didn't have the funding to pay for the server costs. And they had to like shut down the preprint server. And there were like thousands of preprints in it, which is, you know, kind of horrific because it's just PDFs. Like somebody should probably be paying for that. And so, um, I personally find this very cool because you could create a system where by sharing a preprint, you're actually contributing to the sustainability of the open science infrastructure. Like you don't even need to pay money. Like you're just sharing your preprint and some value gets kicked back not only to you, but to the actual people who are like helping to support the technology. So that was kind of the first one and the way it would be implemented would be um, have you all seen on their preprint servers where there's a plot it button? There could also be like a, a research hub button essentially on preprints that um, said whether the author claimed it and then um, some other things that I'll talk about in a second. That's kind of similar to what Anton and Nami are working on with post review. So that was the first idea, basically like integrating with preprints. Um, the second idea is, uh, and this is actually very similar to what Anton and, and Nami are working on with post review. Um, in, in your guys' rubric, you have uh, like, did the author share raw data, right? Or like, is there, was there registration or pre-registration associated? We used to. <laughs> so maybe so we will. <laughs> what they were thinking is like, um, you could create rewards for people to verify if there was a pre-registration or like if the actual methods followed what was described in the pre-registration. And so have some kind of like validation ability um, to say like, oh, hey, here's the link that was shared with the paper that says, here's our raw data. When you click that link, does it actually take you to raw data that's relevant to the paper? And so confirming, basically creating rewards where validators earn coins for like making sure that everything's you know ship shape and then the author also earns coins from having people validate that they actually did their um you know pre-registration and open science practices of like data sharing uh effectively do you mind the question yeah absolutely. so the validators are they going to be from the side of osf or from from your side I, I think from from any side, it, it reminds me a little bit of like oracles in crypto. There's like these prediction markets where um, you have to know whether an event actually happened or not. And there are real life people who say like, yes, you know, like Barack Obama won the presidential election. And there's some crypto economic uh, incentive models to make sure that like the truth actually gets reported. That we so, so there will be people on Research Hub who have a goal of, you know, essentially comparing the preprint to the published paper and uh, coming up with a judgment whether it's accurate and you know following up and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's kind okay. of it. Okay. And then um, those were the two main ideas. Did uh, I guess Thomas or Kobe, did you guys hear anything else during the call that was 
pretty low barrier? Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, no, I think that was, that was the majority of it, yeah. Yeah, that was. Looking at my notes now. Yeah, the call was pretty high level, so. So I guess um, when it comes to integrating with them, uh, we, we probably end up doing something small first and like seeing how it worked and then growing from there. So uh, curious what you all think would be like the most effective way to interface with Open Science Framework. You mean from the side of the users? What do you mean by interface? Yeah, like we can combine our services with theirs in order to help kind of grow the research hub community and also help create incentives for specific behaviors um, that Open Science Framework is trying to make happen. Yeah, I think it like it per works perfectly almost out of the box. You could just make another type of posts, right? We have the papers, posts, and you could add preprints as a third category. And yeah, all of those uh, submitted through OSF would just be there. That's perfect. Uh, my concern is on the side, how do you stop uh, like entire platform being spammed? Because you said that you would immediately get tokens. How do you stop the abuse in that case? So I think what happens now with a lot of preprint servers is the preprint has to be approved for publication. There's like a editorial board that will look at the preprint itself to make sure that it's actually like um, not even necessarily like totally high quality science, but that it adheres to the regulations of the preprint server. So in order to have it be automatically posted, you'd have to create content that was viable enough, at least for the editorial board on the preprint server. So in theory, it'd be, I guess you could spam it, but it'd be a lot harder. Like it would, you'd have to create something that could fool a couple PhDs. I mean, there is GPT-3 that is already doing that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, just a slight worry on that side. Have you seen there was an archive paper, I think it came out yesterday or the day before, is at the top of Hacker News, is like tortured, tortured phrases where there are entire journals that are filled up with purely AI produced scientific papers <laughs> and like no, no one knows it. Somebody's like banking tons of publications off it. Um, I mean, even without any like uh, auto generation of the content, you can just uh, mesh a few different papers. Uh, if you have the incentive to get some money out of it, I wouldn't be surprised at all that there are people that would do something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm almost impressed with the potential creativity of the spammers there. There's something that they're also working on uh, in conjunction with DARPA called SCORE where it's basically an AI that reads papers and then pumps out like a reproducibility score. So like, it, you know, super like high level, like it's not very trustworthy, but in theory, I think over time, we'd be able to have some kind of mechanism to help like find, you know, uh, spam AI written papers if that becomes a problem. Yeah, I participated in the program and uh, I was a writer, writing, training the people. So that was fun. Uh, one thing about preprint server, I'm I've been volunteering for like preprint as moderator, and this preprint server site archive they use post moderation system where anybody can submit anything, but you know the moderators will screen out later. Um, so I would I'm guessing this practice value by server to server. So if you want to start like kind of small, maybe focus on one server first and just try to figure out because yeah, like maybe there is a lot of heterogeneity. So what you're saying is with the post-moderation, essentially, maybe you shouldn't give out tokens immediately, but after they have been selected? Yeah, so that, yeah, that, that's possible. So post-moderation happens, like when the, you post a paper, it says like it's not reviewed yet, but it's available. And after some time, the moderator, one of the hours uh, looks at it and then it's gonna say it's moderated or it's approved. So you can use that scheme maybe uh, to integrate that to interface with uh, sci, sci, sci archives specifically if you're interested. I think there are potentially things we could do too where um, like the tokens wouldn't be released until like three or four scientists have, you know, approved that this is a good 
preprint, you know, like a certain high rep users have to say, hey, yeah, this is legit before the tokens get released. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, that way we don't like uh, blindly trust like whatever comes over to us, even though OSF is reputable, but uh, it's nice to have that kind of control. I think in general, like uh, collaboration with third parties uh, could be a really fun opportunity and experience in learning and understanding what is required to integrate with other services. So like whatever ends up being the first proposal for actual integration is a good learning opportunity. So, and not just with OSF, but in general. So th that's really good. Yeah, I think backing up um, a couple steps, like, is, is it important to you all that we integrate with other tools that exist within kind of this open science space? Like, is that is that important to you? Dragon, no, Philip, yes. I think it legitimizes research up in the eyes of the crowd, for sure. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. Like, it... Uh... It uh, improves reputation and uh, the distribution of research hub, but is it necessary? I wouldn't think so. Uh, and like, if research hub only depends on the dis on the distribution through second and third parties, well, it needs more stability than that, perhaps. So yeah, maybe maybe like it's good, uh, but having more direct channels and a direct product of its own definitely wouldn't be a mistake. I mean, maybe it's just in psychology, but the the predatory journals, so the, you, you know, the one you brought up earlier that that publish stuff for money that you know is written by AI or by I don't know an undergrad or a child. <laughs> so <laughs> stuff like that is very prevalent. And people are super cautious about it. So this is one of the reasons it's kind of hard. Like I wouldn't like I wouldn't make a meeting with my advisor and be like, oh, hey, wanna check out Research Hub? Just because I know people are super cautious, and if there is like a stamp of approval, oh, this project is you know works in conjunction with uh, OSF, then people will will be like, okay, that looks safe, right? I can share articles there, things like that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I always go back to um, some of the advice that Brian's given us, where like you don't want to do any partnerships until you have product market fit. And you have that organic growth, and then you can throw fuel on the fire to that actual value that you're creating. But sometimes, and you know, I'm a first-time entrepreneur; I don't know anything, so, so we're the grain of salt. But like, um, sometimes I think like that makes sense for a product like Instagram or Snapchat, where you know there's no like like prestige necessarily required to have a user create like good content. But in science, like there is this like oh man, is my career going to be totally screwed if I end up like sharing this data openly? And mm -hmm. like, I want to make sure that if I do do this, there's, you know, there's a relationship of trust behind it. So yeah, I have a, a mixed mind where, you know, I have so much respect for open science framework. And I think aligning ourselves with them, like would do wonders for like our, our brand. And then I, I also think like pulling back from just a standard like tech product to kind of like a crypto community, it, if open science framework eventually starts using research coin in their own workflow, that's amazing for us. Like if, if research coin, you know, is independently being utilized by multiple different projects, like that is, you know, that guarantees that research coin will live, even if the MVP of research hub doesn't have the traction necessary, or we'd never find like that value prop that causes that organic product market fit growth. So yeah, I think it's, it's there's a lot of things to think about and positives and negatives in both directions. But overall, I agree. I think it's, it's an awesome opportunity to align ourselves with like people who are very well respected. I can totally agree with your point that it may depend on the, in, on the industry, uh, but just like, to try to avoid the trap where by creating uh, collaborations even with very reputable companies, organizations like OSF uh, would be something like lying to yourself that you're building something meaningful and you're just relying on uh, second or third party 
uh, instead, like maybe it also does make sense to try to find a PMF on your own and then uh, explode, like you said. Uh, so yeah, just like avoiding the traps. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Thanks for thanks for sharing that opinion because that that honestly probably would be the healthiest way to grow. And even like it, it seems like we're very aligned with what Open Science Framework wants to accomplish. So I'm I'm sure they would always be there, willing to work with us once we did find that product market fit. Does anybody else have any thoughts when it comes to um, how we could potentially work with OSAP? Cool. So, so, the next so yeah, sorry, uh, but uh, just uh, there is definitely incentivizing uh, posting preprints, and they do have some sort of like uh, collaboration features. And it would be great if there were some more opportunities around that. Like, I know if you fork a preprint or uh, suggest suggest an improvement or do the commenting on your own, they have their own commenting system. And like, if you could combine that with Research Hub into its own uploading commenting system, like that would make sense. Uh, so not just producing direct content, but also like having collaboration because, well, that is uh, one of the like big differences for open science, not to work just on yourself, but to help others as well. So yeah, just considering that as well. I think that fits well with the feature we're building out next, which is the ELN, the collaborative editor. Yeah, great point. And I just want to add, like, there's a journal using that feature in Psych Archive. Uh, they use hypothesis to comment on papers for the review process. Uh, it's already happening, but maybe there's like a, a way, there's a space where you can go in and uh, hey, we can do much better than that. So just went out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, and uh, we're lucky to have uh, Andrew with us. Who just joined. Uh, Andrew and I have been collaborating a little bit for the past couple of weeks on ways that we can help um, build the research hub community. Essentially, like doing a lot of the legwork when it comes to outreach to potential like ideal users. So, um, Andrew, do you want to uh, just give a quick intro and then kind of like describe how we're working together? Yeah, sure. Hey, guys. Nice to meet all of you. Um, so, yeah, I just reached out to Brian and Patrick. Um, well, it was like a month and a half ago, a couple months ago. Uh, and I'm not, I am not academic at all. I have a bachelor's degree, and that's as much as I will ever probably get. But my wife is a, uh, a PhD uh, postdoc. And so just kind of watching her go through the publishing pain um i've always been really really interested in why it's done the way it's done so when i saw news that uh this was going on and research hub was um kind of trying to leverage crypto to you know ideally get to be the github for scientific literature i was just you know it really piqued my interest just from kind of a hobbyist perspective so uh, i reached out and just offered to to help kind of spread the word i'm i'm in technology sales so i currently work selling uh, google cloud and google maps products um so that's that's kind of where uh that's kind of how we met and essentially what i've been doing the past couple of weeks is just um email email blast to department chairs so just reaching out to chairs and kind of um introducing research hub uh as a platform and trying to just very very briefly encapsulate you know what the mission for research hub is and just get feedback you know honest feedback from these department chairs so um that has only been going on for about a week and a half. And, and truthfully, Patrick, I, I was going through that. Um, I was going through the active users and, and new join lists. And I'm not honestly sure how much of an impact the, the first pass has, has had. Um, I had, you know, nothing, none of the uh, emails screamed out. Now, a lot of them, are, you know, Gmail accounts. So it necessarily wouldn't trace back to the emails that I was using um, to reach out to them. But um, yeah, just just getting started and trying to think of ways to to kind of get the word out there and and also think of how you know you guys uh, as as kind of like a core user base um, can position it to to your colleagues and your peers and and folks you work with. So um, again, I'm a total outsider, total noob to this whole world. But if there's anything I can do to help, I'm I'm happy to do so. And we've been super lucky to have Andrew helping out because he's been sort of pushing us in directions that like you know I, i'm not a salesperson i'm not like totally comfortable with but like bringing up ideas in order to help like grow the community that i do think will be super valuable for instance uh um 
you emailed me earlier today about potentially sponsoring a conference. So I wanted to chat with everybody to see like if you all thought that would be a good idea and like which ones potentially would be worth looking into. But before we talk about that, I think it would maybe make sense to brainstorm for a second about like the um, demographics for potential cold email outreach. Um, I know that like department chairs would be ideal, right? Because if we were able to get people like who could top down say, hey, my department needs to be using this in order to like help out with like value prop ABC, it would be the best case scenario. But oftentimes people who are at like the very uh, top of the academic food chain, um, I've had pretty poor responses from them. Generally, like not totally into blockchain. They've had a lot of success in the current dynamics. So they aren't totally motivated to necessarily adopt something new where they might lose some prestige. So uh, when it comes to like potentially um, crafting cold emails to try and build the community and have like a little bit more activity going on in Research Hub, uh, what do you all think would be the best demographic to try and target with that sort of uh, outreach? Um, so you mentioned the area heads or department heads, and I'm actually, I don't think it's, it, for now, in our particular situation, I think it would be the best idea just because first of all, they are super busy. And second, they didn't even, they didn't really have direct control or it's like, it's not in the culture for the department head to give advice to the labs to how to handle business. So I think the most effective would be emailing the lab, mm -hmm. you know, the, the lab directors or PIs. Usually they are the last offer in the in the publication with multiple offers. So maybe this would be one of the ways to target them. Yeah, non tenors mm -hmm. What is what does TI stand for? Uh, PI per primary investigator. Got it. Principal. Principal, yeah. The, the main question I have and I thought about it too, but Anton, maybe you know better, like how do you go about getting a list of PIs? Where do we scrape that data from? We can also hire um, uh, freelancers at like a pretty cheap rate who can go through uh, websites and papers in order to put together lists. Mm, yeah, papers, existing papers, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say the best is really just <clears throat> going, I think, to individual university sites and, and trying to get the organization table from from what's publicly you know published um on on their websites i so for this first round for department chairs i actually have access through you know my current job um to a, like a lead management tool that allows me to just export certain amounts of contacts and so one of the things i was able to do was department chair uh like that it was actually really really easy to to kind of drill it down to that um i think you know um Heads of lab could could also potentially be a relatively easy poll from that in terms of just really, really quickly get in, you know, a list of like 200, 300, 400 names or whatever. So I might I might try that next. I think the the the, P, uh, the PIs and the non tenure faculty would would definitely be more of a manual um, poll. Uh, and yeah, to your point, Patrick, it might, I don't know, hiring like a couple people on like TaskRabbit to just compile that or something. Could work. Yeah, we've done Corby, that. Too. Or right. just Andrew, if you need any help putting together the list, let me know because we can we can hire some people to help put that together. I, I even had success in the past, like reaching out to PIs that are at uh, undergrad institutions, so schools that don't have a graduate school. Um, they tend to be like a little bit less publication focused and more like actual learning focused. So I, I had decent success. That was like two years ago, though, so pretty pretty long time, but. Yeah, like the, the the tier two or three, I think researchers are probably the ones that'll be most receptive to what we're trying to cold outreach with. And do you have do you have any way to just get kind of like a cross section of who kind of active users are today, demographically speaking? Like, you know, where do they come from? What are they currently doing? Um, is that is that something that you can analyze or or at least like just kind of roughly say, hey, I noticed a lot of people in this position or or a lot of people who have this type of experience um, seem to be more, you know, active on the platform. 
yeah, it's definitely early career researchers. So like PhD students, um, postdocs. We've had a couple like MD PhDs, a couple of PIs. Um, one of our like biggest users is Vitaly, who runs a lab at um, University of Leipzig, and um, he's like early career but has a professorship. So kind of on the younger end, like crypto friendly, ideally, but that's hard to find. Um, and trying to exit the current incentive structure of academia. I mean, that, that should be uh, pretty telling about who you should be looking for. And I remember us talking uh, on past community calls that it is exactly early career researchers that should be like research hub should be focusing on uh, simply because uh, PIs and people in similar positions aren't early adopters. They actually want to minimize risks and not to take huge risks. Uh, and perhaps reaching PIs and uh, people in such positions would exactly be like uh, trying to lie to yourself that you are doing something and making some sort of progress instead of still figuring out how do you make it possible for ECRs or people on a similar level to uh, earn a lunch for their work uh, in open science. So yeah, I, I think it's a, a mistake to actually go to PIs and similar. Dragon, kind of in the same logic of build a product that has value and growth and then do like partnerships on top of it? Yes, very similar. <laughs> cool. I've also in the past had a lot of success just like going through GitHub and searching like biochemistry PhD and then pulling out emails from like the GitHub list. Um, so yeah. But Andrew, I'll, I'll help you with that. And I'll, I'll, we, we can put together some free answers to help us build some uh, outre outreach lists. Perfect. Cool. Um, yeah, and so then kind of on that same uh, uh, note, are there any specific like uh, conferences that you are aware of that have like kind of focused on that demographic of early career researchers that we could try and get involved with and get research hub in front of? Psychonomics. Psychonomics. I'll write that down. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most progressive and active and determined people in psychology and surrounding disciplines. By the way, uh, I'm not sure. I think the calls for all proposals are already passed. Uh, but for like for Research Hub to appear on a meta science conference, it kind of makes super great sense. But I think the calls are already done. So sorry for a late notice. Yeah, no worries. I saw that on uh, uh, OSF Twitter today, and I was like, oh, that would have been perfect. Yeah, and just and just as a little context, um, this was actually uh, you know I was talking to my wife about it, and she so she goes to the Gordon Research Conference for her field, which is uh, cultural heritage um, conservation, and uh, so she's actually chairing the seminar, and she believes that most because you know there's hundreds of Gordon uh, conferences, she thinks most have these seminars, and they're essentially focused at the early career, uh, either either. Um, uh, postdocs or current PhD uh, graduate students. Um, and so she was, she was the one that kind of like got me onto the idea. And it seems, I think what seems really interesting about it is that, you know, there's like low barrier to entry because it's a really, really cheap fee. You know, it's like 500 bucks and you get your logo on there. Um, you get to connect with the chairs of the conference and the seminar um, and kind of evangelize with them. So when you're, you know, when People at the conference are like, what the hell is Research Hub? Um, you know, you have people that can knowledgeably answer um, and people that you might have turned into an ally uh, between, between you know, signing up and, and when the conference started. Um, and it's really, it's really scalable and repeatable, right? There's hundreds of them that happen every single year. So um, that, that was, I think, kind of the context to why, to why maybe Patrick added this as an agenda item. But yeah, if there, if there are any... Like the psycho, I like the psychonomics one. If there's anything like that that you guys think would just tend to have like that more kind of liberal or open crowd, um, you know, people who might be more open to the idea of something like Research Hub and people, I think one of the biggest things that I've maybe 
it, maybe this is prejudice isn't real, but I kind of feel like like the older generations probably aren't psyched about crypto and just like anything that's involved with crypto kind of like freaks them out. So maybe going for a younger audience or at least a more kind of open-minded audience um, makes sense to me. Again, just as just superficially knowing what I know about this, this kind of industry. Um, but yeah, any, any ideas or any thoughts are totally welcome. We'll end up creating a, uh, like an outreach channel in the Slack too. So we can have kind of async discussion around that stuff and float ideas. Um, one other thing that just popped up in my head, I'm curious for the, um, people who are trying to get jobs out of their PhD programs. Have you all ever seen like there's almost consultants that work with PhD students in order to like make them more eligible uh, to hire like an industry? I, I had a friend once who did something like this and I was thinking like if we could interface with these groups that help to make, you know, PhDs more hireable and say, hey, you can display your knowledge on Research Hub. I'm not sure if that would be a value prop for them, but it could be worth reaching out because that would be like the exact audience that we'd want early career researchers who are looking for a job and need help um have you all had any experience with those types of consultants is are you talking about job in industry or job in uh, i mean industry meaning non academic jobs versus academic jobs or both i think the one that i'm thinking of it was for people transitioning out of academia to help them with like networking and like finding someone you know where their skill set would apply but I've also seen stuff for like how to like essentially maximize your application to be a postdoc or something like that. Yeah, because it's, if it's from academia to industries, then they're not as interested in having their papers on display in the first place, right? Because it's not part of their resume. Well, not a meaningful part. Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. Um, so the last thing I want to grab sorry, just a, sorry, just a question. How do you call those consultants? Like, how do you even find them? Uh, I can't remember. There's a term. It's like um, I'll send it to you afterwards, Dragon. But there's there's a couple of people who I've come across and thought about reaching out to, where they basically have a career of consulting with PhD students on how to like like change your LinkedIn to say that you're you know looking to be hired and stuff like that, like small tricks to make yourself more eligible. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> cool. Yeah, so the last thing that I wanted to chat about is uh, during our team sync this Friday, we, we're kind of at like a little bit of a crossroads where we're not sure what we want to build next. Um, we have this electronic lab notebook feature and a laboratory who's agreed to pilot it um, it's the quantum biology folks. They're really cool. It's an awesome lab. They'll create, I think like a plus ideal content. Um, but we'd have to build the features like basically specifically for them and use them as feedback in order to refine it and hopefully scale it up to other labs. Um, or the hypothesis evidence graph feature, which we've shown to you guys a bunch of times where the idea is like, you can, uh, post a hypothesis saying, Hey, masks, uh, help prevent the spread of COVID and then add citations to it and be able to like criticize actual um, like logic behind potential hypotheses. So we'll end up kind of presenting both of these that are sync on Friday and then making a recommendation for like what we think as a team we should pursue. So I'd love to be able to say, hey, like the community thinks this, you know, team thinks this, community thinks this, executive thinks this, you know. So Wait, all... so you, so for one option, you already have people who want to use it and they will be actively using it. You know it for a fact. And for other feature, you don't know. You you, you ship it and maybe, maybe hopefully people will start using it. Right? We if have it's... A mm -hmm. verbal commitment. So we don't know for sure that they will use it, but they've, they've already invested maybe like 10 hours helping us kind of scope it out. So... Yeah, verbal commitment. If it's not good, they might not use it, you know. But ideally, they would. I, I feel like um, if there if there was hard pressure for people, if there will be like real demand for the hypothesis graphing, 
people can already kind of achieve it by just arguing uh, in comments under a post. They don't do it, right? So there is no like urgent demand for sure. Yeah, and there is a super huge risk of over committing. Like if you're building features for a specific uh, profile of users or a very specific user, uh, then yeah, there's a huge risk there. Uh, but I can agree, like if there is already an expressed interest for a like for ELNs and not for uh, hypothesis graph, then like, well, that sounds better. And uh, again, back from some of the previous uh, community calls, uh, it seemed that ELNs had uh, greater potential of moving research hub in the direction in like which is kind of perceived direction which res research hub should take in a sense that it's about displaying science and uh, including the community into your working and then creating this economic where you can I know pay for the content patreon for science or whatever it just seems more in line of what research hub should be about let's put it that way cool does anyone else have any thoughts well i kind of agree with the dragon but like uh, i wouldn't abolish uh, like the, the the other feature but uh, like uh, anton said as well i mean i think that if we get some more traction on the rh site with the proposition of uh, integrating an ELN, uh, I guess uh, you have to pursue the ELN idea. Because it's now like we sometimes, some days we get uh, some other people as well on our age, but like most of the days it's just uh, Anton and Vitali. Yeah. <laughs> they post a lot. Uh, so I guess that integrating like, I think like uh, all the conferences we have to get people on board like I know that we have to have our own value proposition but like I think collaborating now is the time yeah I agree and then also just to uh, be explicit we wouldn't be like trashing the hypothesis evidence graph feature we just come back to it once we finished with the ELN so it, it would just be delaying it probably for eight weeks or so. It's impressive if you can build ELN in eight weeks. <laughs> It'll be a very much V1, but the ability to collaborate and uh, share. We also, there are a couple of open source tools that help make some of the really challenging engineering parts possible. And then I guess the absolute last thing is we are almost finished up with the author claiming feature where in theory, like if you have a publication, you can say, hey, I'm the author and claim it and earn uh, tokens associated with that. So um, like I have a couple of friends who have published papers, so I'm going to ask them to claim their papers just to test it. But uh, once it's ready on staging, um, I'd love to put it in the mod channel. And if you all know anybody who would be interested in helping us test it, I think that would be super helpful because this one also what? has. What is there Sorry, multiple offers? Can each Everyone, of them claim? Yep. Everybody claims their own profile and then earns a portion of the rewards that the okay. paper. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And we can also tweak how the rewards are given out. So if, I think they're like evenly distributed throughout all the authors right now. And like if if like your your friends are like, hey, whoa, I was the first author. Like I need to be getting like 65% of these tokens. Like that's great feedback for us to know in order to make sure that we structure it in a way where you know it's it's done appropriately. You should also incentivize who claims first, so people will be rushing to claim as many papers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. that is so evil, but probably efficient, actually. What happens a lot of time with crypto projects is like uh, it's just based on time. So it'll be like in the first three months you get you know ten thousand, in the next three months you get two thousand, in the next three months you get five hundred or something. So a little bit of time pressure, but it ends up balancing out if the marketplace grows. Uh, how do you verify that the person is the author? Like, this is a question. So actually. right now, you have to have an academic email address that's like publicly tied to who the author is. 
and we have moderators basically go in and approve like is this person's email address uh like who they say to be and then we send them an email and have them like basically verify from that email address that makes sense cool shouldn't we like um or like have something in place that links the emails to their orchid ids because like orchid has been an initiative to really like uh, have people on the right publications and stuff and maybe uh, reaching out to them maybe collaborate or, or, or steal some ideas from them uh, to our, like the ID I don't know. it would orchid be when I create an orchid account there was no verification whatsoever I could have picked any name not mine any other name so i don't know if you can use it as a barrier yeah but the thing is like um if you see yeah it could only help of course maybe but like if you see that that person has all these publications and he claims the same publications then the chances of being the the right guy are higher than like if just somebody random uh makes up an email and then randomly selects papers that are like that don't come from the same author on orchid for instance yes but i can agree sense. with uh anton like it still doesn't prove anything it's hard it's a difficult thing we we tried to integrate with orchid earlier and we can definitely do it it's just anyone with an orchid id you know ends up having it associated with their profile um but yeah, it's it's tough because if there's like a famous PI at Stanford who doesn't know about Orchid, someone else can pretend to be them. And um, yeah, e even the way that we're uh, verifying things now manually is not ideal. And this is kind of like a stopgap sort of solution in order to like help us get more traction and then more resources and then more engineers to build out something that's like foolproof where we can integrate it with Orchid and it actually still has the protection that we need to make sure we're not giving out tokens to like random scammers. So Coinbase has identity verification. <laughs> you should totally get that feature into Research Hub and uh, do an actual identity check. <laughs> that yeah. would be ideal. So we have kind of talked about that. Like Coinbase wallet is tied to like a person's actual identity, like their social security number. So. There's definitely something we could do there. Um, I think that would be a lot of work, though. So maybe in the future. Um, cool. Yeah, so that's pretty much all I had for this call. Do you have uh, any questions for us? Just as one thought about like login system, right? We are using Google login, and we are actually so by doing that, blocking users from the countries who are using Google, for example, China, right? So just. I, I think we all know about this, but just that cost so that sort of my my mind because like we are kind of excluding people from the participating in the platform. So um, it's like geo blocking. I think you're, you're saying geo blocking is bad, and we shouldn't do that. No, no, no. Like uh, so, in China, you can't use Google. So right. in that way, like Chinese researchers can't participate in research hub, and I don't know the other countries maybe uh, blocking Google. So that's a thought. Because we require the Google sign-in. So you have to have Google in order to, yeah, totally. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of complaints of just having Google sign-in. That's like one of the number one things people complain about. Um, we, we think uh, internally that that's OK for the time being, and that there are enough people with Google sign-ins where we can still, in theory, try and find product market fit. And then um, like maintaining your own sign in stuff is like not a trivial amount of work. Um, there's a lot of security that needs to happen where it makes us like a lot more vulnerable. Um, and Google has the resources to deal with that kind of security. So in theory, basically what we're doing is outsourcing to them for the time being until we have the team required to be able to build it out right and make sure that like, you know, you can't just steal my screen name and take all my tokens. So, um, yeah, 100% agreed that it's not ideal to have just Google as our sign-in option. But unfortunately, it's just the reality of the situation probably for the next six months or so. Cool. Anybody have anything else? Awesome.
Well, thanks again for joining. This is super cool. And thanks for coming, Andrew. Appreciate it, man. Good to see you. Yeah, definitely. That's me, guys. See you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Bye. See you. See you.